explain and define restoration ecology and a little bit of how we got started. Then I'm going to kick it over to Karen. It's going to go over one of one of our funner projects. So I would say out of the hundreds of projects we've done, and maybe ten that we really were super stoked about. It ranges from very little money and just a piecemeal little project to big bucks and well planned and well installed and well maintained over time. And this one in Malibu was, was quite a neat project. We were just down there about a month ago with some people we will talk about near the end. So we, we both teach at City College and before I started teaching there, Karen was involved in a restoration project on campus. It was a mitigation for widening Cliff Drive that goes up past the campus. And she would already worked at the Botanic Garden when she was a student at City College before she became a teacher. And she learned all her native plants. And so she helped put together a book of all the native plants for the, the grounds crew, not to spray them and all that before it became a you know, pet chemical-free campus, but and then I got a job there uh, teaching, and it was the year that we had the big El Nino, 97, and everybody was really concerned about the beaches being polluted uh, throughout the whole summer. I mean, it rained all of February, every single day of February it rained, I think it was like 60 inches of rain that year, and all this crap came down the creeks, and every beach was posted, no swimming. And the surfers got pissed off, and the swimmers, and the kite surfers, and the hand surfers, and fishermen. And they put all this pressure on the city and the county to clean the creeks up. So the Clean Creek Committee was started, and the, the uh, Major B created the City Creeks Committee and all that. Well, there had been some restoration going on prior to that, but it was on a small scale, and uh, they weren't using the right plants. So what happened was, People were buying plants down in LA with, with seed collected at Camp Pendleton. Well, biologists and botanists were looking at these hybridization problems going on between the species that is from Santa Barbara and the same species, but it's a, a different genotype from San Clemente, right? And then they were hybridizing, and it was downgrading the gene pool and changing all the genetics. So they all banded together and they got the city and the county to create uh, a part of the general plan, the conservation element, saying that when you're doing restoration, you should uh, use only local genetics. But it also said when feasible. So all these people were putting these plants into the wrong genetics because nobody was growing them. So we had this neat little opportunity to move into Santa Barbara High School, an old, old horticulture facility that went back to the 20s. A lot, of the, a lot of the big trees in Santa Barbara were grown by high school kids at that place way back when. But it was completely run down. We got a couple projects. Our first one was the Rotoboro Beach, that creek that flows into Henry's right there. And we didn't have any money to fix this place up. It was just trashed. So we started this nonprofit, 501c3, Growing Solutions, right? Then you can go after soft money, right? You can get grants. You know, the Hutton Foundation gave us some money, the Santa Barbara Foundation gave us some money, the city of Santa Barbara gave us some money, and on and on and on. Somehow we were able to raise a couple hundred thousand dollars over a year and a half or something like that, and we bumped this whole place out. The problem is that there wasn't enough room. We started getting all these orders. So then the Ivy Park and Restoration District said, we have got a place for you to build a nursery. We moved over there. And then the county said, we need a bunch of plants and you don't have enough room, so here's another piece of land that's over by the, the county dump. And then Summerlin wanted a nursery to restore the Summerlin being well preserved. And then uh, the airport wanted a big nursery to restore the Lea Slough. And then Santa Cruz Island wanted one to the restore. So at one time we had seven native plant nurseries going at one time, Santa Barbara Island. It got really wild. It was super fun. A lot of stuff was going on. And then they had the crash of 08. And that sort of changed the whole thing because the government got broke, the city got broke, the county got broke. Um, and that whole push, all the people that we were in the government uh, retired and new people came in and it wasn't really the major focus. There's still work, you know, 
Um, but it's not like it was when we had seven nurseries just charging it. We are, right now we're on two nurseries, one at the airport and one up the Gaviota Coast, um, uh, Marshall Point, Maricosa Reunion exit. Anyway, so that's how we got started. Um, ecological restoration is restoring the structure and the function to the habitats. So the structure would be the shape of a creek or the shape of an estuary wetland or uh, you know, the structure. So what happens is bulldozers and chainsaws and housing and everything else come in and they alter the structure of something so it doesn't function ecologically. So you're restoring the structure and the function. If you put the structure back right, then it starts to function again, right? And this is a perfect example right here. There was almost no fish in this lagoon before we started this. Almost no birds. The water quality was incredibly bad. It actually had hepatitis in there and polio and all kinds of, it was just a sewer cesspool. Um, you could even smell it from miles away. So the state parks decided that they would uh, fix it. And, uh, and it was an incredible, incredible story about Karen telling. I mean, we had all kinds of stuff going on. So, Malibu Lagoon, who's been there? Anybody been there? You gotta, you gotta go there sometime. It's, it's, it's a nice spot. <clears throat> yeah. Surfer's Paradise. Uh, right out there, beyond there, is is a very good surf break that is is famous, and the, the you know surfers surfers love it. They used to call this the polio pit. Like, that's how bad it was. Our first orientation there was about you know being aware of every yucky thing that was in that mud. So it kind of tells you how bad it was. Now this is this is right down in Malibu, which is right next to L.A. You know it's a Huge urban area. It's a it's a former wetland, right? Restored wetland now. How many wet How many wetlands have been destroyed in our country? Almost all of them. You, you all have to heard about that, right? And worldwide too. Why is it that people have destroyed wetlands? Right. Let's build an airport. What a great place to make a test landing, right? It's gonna be a it's gonna be a soft landing. And I you dig it out for the harbor there. Dig it out for the harbor. You know, put in fancy homes where everybody can have their own little dock. But what functions do wetlands do perform? Right. Yeah. They protect against like hurricanes and storms. They they buffer. They also act as nurseries for all the little baby fish that we love to eat, like halibut, right? They also absorb, they, the water coming off the land, they absorb any yucky stuff, you know, not ex excess nitrates and, and heavy metals. The military uses wetlands to, you know, to absorb heavy metals and then they harvest that biomass and they burn off the biomass and they have the heavy metal left, right? So wetlands perform a lot of functions for us. This one here was probably fairly intact until Caltrans uh, built Highway One there, and then they, then they, you know, their their priority was building a road. It wasn't about the wetland. In the 1960s, there was a ball field right here. It didn't work very well because, you know, when the big rains would come or big swells would come, it would turn back into what it wanted to be, right? That's the thing about nature, is it, it, wants, to, it wants to perform. So they tried to do a restoration, and they tried to do a slew, and they didn't quite get it right. And because they didn't get it right, what they had were stagnant pools of water. And which then just creates more, more problems, right? And, and also, as far as the, the human aspect, then people are once again saying, this wetland should just be filled in because it's just a stinky polio pit, right? So if, if, they, if they're not functioning right, then they are a cesspool. So um, state parks, who owns this property, and, and they have this beautiful park there that you all can go visit and get to the beach. They, they made an effort, they did years of research determining what to restore to, you know, so in restoration ecology, that's your first question. 
what are we restoring it to? Now, in the case of a wetland, that can be a really difficult question to answer because what kind of wetland is this? You know, and, and there's people who, who, I mean, they spend their life's work just working on the different kinds of wetlands that is possible. This particular wetland has a freshwater creek that comes into it that seasonally is going to be um, have a, a fair amount of water. You know, it drains from the from all the Santa Monica Mountains. And I throw a little two cents in there. Yeah. Okay, so back barrier wetland. So in the summertime, there's a complete dam all the way across it, so it doesn't get tidal flow from the ocean. And then in the wintertime, when the rains come down Malibu Creek, it blows a hole out for the winter. And Bleeda Beach is one of those back barrier wetlands, part of the Bleeda Slough. So then all of a sudden, then this just becomes more like a lake, brackish water, sort of salty, sort of fresh in the, in the summertime. And in the wintertime, it has tidal flow and it's more salty. So it's a very complex. Right, so you've got to have plants that, so part of your structure is your plant community. So you've got to have plants that can thrive in fresh water or salt water or brackish water. Right, so, it, so it's, it's pretty diverse. So we were asked, um, we've done a lot of wetland work, we've worked at Alita Slough and a lot of, and so we were asked to participate um, in this project by uh, California State Parks. And then the paperwork started. <laughs> and you have, in, any given project has um, a whole kind of, I mean, there's jurisdictional stuff and there's all sorts of parameters. And so you always have, this initial meeting to say, okay, what are our parameters? You know, what can you imagine the parameters are at a public state park? Visitor access, all this stuff. Visitor access. Parking. Safety is always right up there, number one. Uh, a good experience. You know, the park system wants their visitors to have a good experience. Um, and and. Uh, and what have you got going on? You know, this this right here is about an invasive snail from New Zealand that is in some of the, it's not in the Malibu lagoon, but it's in canyons adjacent. And it, and the little egg, this, the egg from the snail is spread on people's tennis shoes and boots as they're hiking in other canyons. And so, you know, part of it is, is how do we, how do we not spread this snail into Malibu? You know, um, because it's so. so what, what's the what's the problem with invasives? Anybody have any idea? Why why do we care if invasives, whether they're plants or animals or snails or bugs, why do we care if they move in? They don't have a natural predator in that area. Exactly. And so then, if they don't have a natural predator, they they tend to to take over and they and, and they become. Invasive. They too squeeze many. out the natives. And they squeeze out the natives. So this is just demonstrating that we had a lot of, um, there's a lot of permitting stuff, a lot of uh, kind of jurisdictional stuff. Uh, Cal uh, State Parks owns the property, but they had, uh, what was the Marks Foundation? The Bay Foundation. Yeah, well, uh, Santa Monica Bay Foundation. The on-the-ground project manager was from the Santa Monica Bay Foundation, which is another nonprofit. Um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. You have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. You've got NOAA because of, they're involved in marine issues. Coastal Commission. Coastal Commission, Coastal Conservancy. So, a lot of players when it comes to So that. all these players have have a perspective that they're coming from, right? And and some of it's law and you have to and you have to make good with that. Um, so the the way you usually do it is you have a you, you, the research has been done, it's been decided what to restore to. You have a big meeting, you have all the players come together. Everybody gets together to, to have sort of a back and forth, you know, what are we, you, you know, what are any particular issues, you know, how long is it going to take us to grow plants, you know, what's the bird nesting season, um, when, when can we expect the, the sand barrier to break free, you know, all those sorts of things. And now in the case of Malibu, 
we had one factor that we that we never that we don't usually have. Usually people kind of welcome us and they say, oh, thank you so much. We're so glad you're here to fix this stinky, smelly place. Um, in this case, this is the first project where we have ever had, we've ever had an active and vocal and visual uh, protesters, and we've had armed guards accompany us to the project site. <laughs> so on our opening day of hitting the ground, um, collect salvaging material, we had more guns on site than shovels. We had California CHP, we had um, State LA County Sheriff. Rangers, and we had LA County Sheriff. And, and a command center. <clears throat> and a command center yeah. that later went on to uh, service President Obama's landing, uh, in LAX. landing in LAX. So that was really new and interesting to us because we kind of consider ourselves the good boys. And we were really good. And, and this, I've always thought, was really an interesting. I mean, what is this lady saying? <laughs> I mean, I look at that and I just go, what? <laughs> I mean, that just really struck me as So, anyways, so here's here's the player. This is this is Suzanne Good. She's she's the head of the state parks uh, for the Santa Monica's. This is one of her top people. Um, another gal, and then this was Mark, who's who's the on the ground uh, project manager, and, and you can see he's you know. Excel spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, and maps. Right? What plants are going where? Can I drop back? So when we get the get the call to do this project, the first thing we want to do is see the plant list, and we also want to see the collecting range. And they did a very good job with the plant list. In fact, they found stuff from our herbarium samples that are plants that are extinct. Right? They put, go find these plants. So we spent two and a half years just collecting seed. And our seed collecting range was uh, Point Magoo Naval Air Station to the Bayona Wetlands in yeah. Nets. And then up to into the Santa Monica's. So right. before any of these plants ended up here, we already had two and a half years with the seed collecting and then growing the plants and all that. Right. And and in seed collecting, you were, you were hunting around. I mean, we're, we're going to other parks in the area. We're going to you know, little dead end roadside turnouts. I mean, uh, we're just you're going looking, on to military bases. We went on to the military base. I mean, you're looking everywhere, and you're looking at your historical data that says, okay, this plant was last known here in 1950. You know, and you're going, look, oh, there's an apartment building there now. It's gone. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a real sort of hunt and peck kind of thing. But they. But they were really trying to have a broad list, which is great. They were trying to get their, their structure and their foundation to be very comprehensive. Right? So they had a wide selection of plants. Um, so that was all a good thing. We actually ended up with an extra year of seed collection, collection because right as we were about to start the project, uh, somebody sued. and. They held the project, that up, for the project up for a year and cost a million dollars, which was just heartbreaking because the restoration dollar is very hard to come by and to spend it in, on lawyers. Yes? Um, why, were you, why were people protesting and why did they sue? Okay, good question. Good question. Okay, so, they were, so I did an informal survey because I had that same question of why were people protesting because I'm thinking. This is a good thing, it smells. Can you go back to the first photo that shows a little bit? Okay, go ahead. So what I discovered in just doing a casual, non-scientific um, question was uh, some people didn't, at that time California's budget was in the, in the toilet and people were concerned with why are we spending money on this when there's other things. What they didn't understand is this was a dedicated pot of money that could only have been spent on this and had been put towards this project 17 years prior to this project. So the money was there and it wasn't going to be spent anywhere else. 
Another another reason was the colony. This was where Pam Anderson and all these rich LA guys lived. <clears throat> so these people here, the colony, which is all multi-million dollar homes with celebrities living in them, is all on septic. Now, do you think that at sea level, next to the beach, is a good place to have a septic system? Probably not. Um, that was one of the things is that a lot of those people knew that they had drain pipes that went into the lagoon and when it was excavated, those became apparent. They'd have to get their septic all upgraded like they can really not afford it. The other, the other thing, big thing was there was a bridge that went across here, which was one of the main reasons the lagoon wasn't functioning because there was no wind flow or tidal flow to be able to move this water around. And the bridge was built by Caltrans when they tried the first restoration that failed. And the plan was to take the bridge away for public access and then run the trail right behind all these billionaires' houses. And they didn't want common people you know, right next to their backyard. So, so what, the, what the colony lost is it lost a privacy screen of a lot of bushes, about 50 feet of bushes and trees. And, and the trail was pushed back to be 10 feet from their property lines, which when, they, when, when all that was done, it was also discovered that these people had illegal gates from their, back, their backyards into the, the park, you know, which their access is supposed to be down their road and that way it's not supposed to be through the park. So that was the, the colony's objection. Well, there's one more. The uh, Andy Irons surfer, he thought that this surf break right here would be destroyed by restoring the lagoon. So you got the surfers against it, you have these billionaires against it, you had just, just the general public who was who liked the bridge walk, which the bridge walk was yeah. really nice. Yeah. It, it was very nice, except that blocking the airflow means it blocked the water flow. Right? And then you have the people who were concerned about the budget. And then you had general people who apparently in Los Angeles there's a there's a group of people who are, are kind of professional protesters. They they get a kick out of that and they've got nothing else to do. And their their big problem with it was that it was gonna look like Disneyland. And the reason being is just over here there's an interpretive area for high school uh, for K twelve to come and do water quality testing. It has this beautiful arbor that looks like seaweed made out of metal. And then there's another interpretive education thing right here teaching people about uh, tides. And then there's a bird line so people who want a bird. And they said, well, this place is going to look like Disneyland. It doesn't. But that, that was, the lawsuit was actually over that and the fact that they thought that this shouldn't be so deep. And State parks did core samples down to where they found where the fill ended, right? And so they did a lot of research to get the, the right uh, excavation, the right elevation um, and depth of the pond. But uh, one of the ecologists, wetland ecologists, said, no, no, this should be much more shallow. And that's what the lawsuit was about. Um, when they did finally excavate it down to the level that they thought was going to be the real old level, they actually found car tires and stuff and stuff down there. So okay. they found the right level. So, so the whole thing with the lawsuit was really sad because, you know, like I said, that's taking restoration dollars and, and putting it in the legal system. Plus it held us back a year. And not putting it in the ground for restoration. Now, it also goes to demonstrate how complicated wetlands can be and how it can be. I mean, the valid discussion is what to restore to, what kind of wetland is that. And there is room in there for discussion and disagreement. It just shouldn't have gone to, to court. Um, you had a question? Okay. And then, so did we answer your question? Was there? This oh, class goes to 430? Yeah. Yes, we got we've got about 15 minutes here, and then we're going to okay. put a Q&A. Okay. Here's part of the interpretive education we do. So we were on plans. We brought them down. We brought our, our city college students. There were other there were other volunteer groups that helped plant. There also was a professional landscape install team that did planting too. Um, the the idea with the flagging is that you you each flag represents a particular species. 
Because you're, the thing about wetlands, the critical thing about wetlands is you're planting per elevations, and the elevations are really small. You know, an inch or two makes a difference in a wetland, depending on which species. So um, you make your best plan, and that's that prior photo of, of Mark with the, with the plan, but then you do your on-the-ground truthing, right, to, to figure out little, little nuances of where things should go. Um, here's the... Here's a couple of the features that Don's talking about. That's a million dollar feature, that's a million dollar feature. They're lovely when you're there and it doesn't feel like it. Every day of the week, about 30 school kids come and they put their microscopes right on this and they take water out of the lagoon and then they look at the water through the microscopes and they learn about, you know, water and, and all the microorganisms in the water and then they have a water quality test kit. So they're teaching these kids the importance of clean water, right? It's a great feature. And then this is teaching the name from the people of this park about tides. You've got to remember, we're close to LA, and there's 20 some odd million people down there. Most people never even go to the beach, right? Much less under yeah. understand where they are. Um, here's, here's just some of our students. Uh, this is just kind of a feel good picture. We had various classes. It took us a couple of years. Um, when we bring students down, we camp at the uh, Malibu State Park up, up at the top there where, where they do a lot of um, filming of movies and, uh, and the TV show MASH and, you know, so that was sort of fun. And uh, so we had kids there. And then here's just another another view. That's just after planting. Yeah, so you can see how they've done all the excavation um, and we've planted the plants, they're not filling in. One of the sort of interesting things that happened is is the birds started coming back almost instantly and uh, there's a lot, a lot of birders in, in that area and one of them, a retired professor from UCLA, was very concerned about the flags disrupting the birds' movements, you know, kind of worrying the birds, you know, making them, stressing them out. And so he requested that once we had planted, we pulled the flags. So that was that was a little nuance that we, we had to change. You can see this, this was the wintertime, the beach was blown out right here, and now you're getting full tidal flow. But then we had opening day, and we still had protesters, and we had police. Yes? Did you guys use your native plants from the nurseries that you're talking about, or did you guys source them elsewhere? No, everything, everything we planted our, was a seed that we had collected from within our boundaries, which is Point Magoo to Bayona, up to the Santa Monica's. We took the seed back to Santa Barbara to our nursery, we grew it up, we hauled the plants back down. Yeah, so everything is the is the genetics of that kind of Malibu region. And that's one of the first things that, that you decide, you know, when you're developing the project is what's going to be our collecting parameters. And it totally depends on the area. We tried to convince them back over here by City Hall, there was a big vacant lot to build a nursery right here. But it's city hall, city property, and the city was against this project. Mm -hmm. So they weren't going to give us nursery space. So we grew everything in Santa Barbara. Yeah. So do you still have those? Like, are you continuing to grow those, those species from? No. So this. So so the plant. So the typical way it works is you have is you have a, a major install time mm -hmm. um, that typically consists of one or two or three larger plantings. You let everything grow and take off. You come back in six months or a year and you say, what's made it, what hasn't, where's our problems, where do we need to do infill? So that's your infill planting, right? And so you can do infill, you do about a year later. If you're really lucky, you get another chance to do another infill if, if you need to. Right? But so, then the plants are gone and you go to another project. Yeah, and so so you, you're typically, you're, you're you know, your planning phase can be anywhere, it's it's never less than a year. In this case, it was 17 years of planning to install. Your install is usually about a year, you know, with some significant events. 
And then what you really want, the most important thing, is to get a, a maintenance and monitoring segment after. And that's where projects really fall short. And for me, I always equate it to buying that fancy new car. You know, it's really exciting to get the car, right? It's not so <coughs> exciting three years later to change the oil and get new tires and, you know, wash out the upholstery. That's the boring, that's the housekeeping stuff. But if you don't do your housekeeping, you can lose your project. Weeds will just take over the whole place. So you hammer the weeds for three or four years until the plants are big enough to shade out the weeds. Right? And we have a we have a shot of what it looks like now. Well, yeah, we do. And so here's here's um, doing doing the install. We had irrigation. Irrigation is really nice to have. It's not, it's some projects don't take the time to do it, um, but it, it makes your, it gives your plants a chance. Yeah. Is that temporary or permanent? That's temporary. Do you, do you find that you typically have adequate funding in the project to make sure that this really important maintenance that you're talking about is happening? <laughs> or is that something that That's you have to add no, no, generally no. Generally no. But you know, a good funder is not going to fund it unless you have that maintenance and monitoring component. Um, but the trouble is a lot of time funders are over here in sort of a financial realm and they're not over here in a, in a horticulture or you know restoration realm. And so they don't, they don't know that that's what they really should be saying. You know, I mean back to the car analogy, you know, if, I, if I'm going to sell you a car, do you have the money to keep making the payments? Right? That's, what, that's how they should be addressing it. And they don't, because everybody gets caught up in the, in the kind of immediate install, let's build the house sort of thing, and they don't think about the maintenance. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem in the industry. And um, it can be mitigated in a lot of different ways, you know. And one of the ways that we did it here <coughs> was we would go down and visit, and we saw a problem with weeds. And Don called up one of the funders who we know personally and said, hey, you know, you guys put in a substantial amount of money. $20 million, and, and let it all go to see, hell. We see a problem happening here. You know, we might want to talk to these folks and, you know, see what's happening. The birders, the Audubon Society got involved because they're all about the birding. They do the Christmas bird camp here now. And, and they didn't like what they were seeing, right? I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of kind of naturalist people out there, you know, birder kind of people who are really paying attention and, they, and they're learning their plants and they're, they know what they're, the birds that they're watching you know, what kind of habitat they need. So There was a two-year maintenance contract, and we got, to kick it, we got them to kick it to five years, right? And that, that's the big, that, that made all the difference in the world. The two years wasn't going to make it. Um, Sometimes you get into problem spots, right? And so then you need to, that's when your infill planting becomes necessary, when you planted stuff and things just aren't taking, and, and then, and then you've got to look again at what's happening. In this case, it was compacted soils. Um, here's an actual planting. One of our planting sessions. We had to take kayaks out to these little islands with the students to plant because, you know, they can't swim out there through the water still polluted. This is pretty fun. Here's a, this is, this is weed man. Low tide, see how low the tide is. You know, weed man is getting the weeds. This is low tide here, this is high tide here. All right. All right. That's a minus tide. Here's our chart. We probably did 50 loads of, maybe more than that, because we could only fit about 3,000. Oh, we probably did more like 75 loads with this truck. We built shelves and you know, shelf it all in. Drove down there. And drove down real carefully. Real slow. Not hit any bumps. So not hit any bumps. Poor plants. California. There's the irrigation. So there's the irrigation system. Um, that kind of overhead irrigation has advantages and disadvantages. One of the disadvantages is it's, is it's 
water and everything, so you're going to get any little weed seed that's going to embrace all that water. Uh, you also get complete coverage, and it's, it's a less expensive system. I mean, and it may not be practical to have individual emitters to each plant. You know, well, so they were worried here, too, about uh, too much salt killing the plants. So they really wanted to flush this because, you know, you got the tide coming up, and they wanted to flush them on a regular basis so that they had better success with the plants. So they really over-irrigated for a while, which was good. That's what they were, that's what they were doing. The irrigation is still there, and they, they run it like twice a year now in the summertime just to make it look pretty because it's a park. They wouldn't have to run it anymore now. But they, they kept it in. You can't see it anymore because all the plants are still big. Uh, here's, here's one of our camping trips, and this is, we told you about our, our employee, Pete, who was a graduate of Westmont. That's his truck and his artwork. We think we know, I think it's obvious where his priorities are. We still teach this class at Santa Barbara City College. If you're interested, and we'll be doing uh, field trips to uh, Santa Cruz Island and probably Santa Rosa Island is, uh, starting in January. Uh, and if you don't, if you, you know, you're not going to get credit for it here at Westmont, but if you want to volunteer as a, an intern or something like that, we can hook you up. Or if you could get, um, I don't know if you have an independent study sort of format. I mean, we're happy to work with work, work with you on that. There's one of our board members, one of our board right here. He's also so a master head chef. Head chef. Yeah. He goes on the, all the Santa Cruz Island trips and cooks like, the best meals you've ever met. So this is a, so there you can see it's, it's starting to fill in a little bit. Um, it's getting the typical June fog. There, this is actually a pile of weeds. So, you know, the weeding's been happening after our our phone calls and, and other people's phone calls. Um, that's the walkway, the the tidal thing. That's the bird line back to back. That's the bird line right here. Yeah. Now we planted willow in here, so the willow all grew up and created a like you know, nice little blind. So the birders can go in there, but most of the birders like to go out to the end where the endangered, endangered snowy plover nest, the very, very end of which is Which is right here. So now you can see the difference now? This is two months ago. Here's what it looks yeah. like now. Here's, a, here's another board member and his wife and our friend from Australia. Um, and so these folks have become kind of stewards of this place, uh, participating in, in weekly bird monitoring. And, uh, They're both retired. And, and Grace, you know, because she know because her husband's one of our board members, she knows I have contact phone numbers for various people. And if she sees something, she does a lot of it's, you know, let's give Mark a call. <laughs> so she's a, she's a watchdog for this. Uh, they have part of the beach fenced off, you know, periodically, and that's why they're standing out here looking in is because it's fenced off for the snowy plovers. So, you know, you have Los Angeles and 20 million people and just a little construction fencing, and it's letting the snowy plovers actually hang out on the beach and do their thing, you know, so, so it's working. We saw some night hairs for the first time. Yeah. Uh, Ninety-nine percent more birds than there was when we started this project. Uh, there's off, off spray, egrets. There's even uh, kites. Um, all I mean, it's amazing. The birds are <coughs> crazy with this. It's, so it's there's a, way better than they imagined. It. There's also a live fish cam that you can just Google the um, uh, Malibu Lagoon fish hey, cam. Pardon? Um, they have a they have a camera that's in the water and you can see the fish swimming by, and so you see a bird once in a while come down and grab it. Like Tom said, the osprey hunt there, and so it's it's an incredible resource for considering that Los Angeles is so close and so many people, and it's very highly visited. I mean, uh, tens of thousands of people go there every year. A lot of them from foreign countries and you walk down the pathway and you hear all sorts of different foreign languages. 
Uh, the surfers are happy because they're no longer getting ear infections every time they go out in the water. Um, I presume the, mal the colony people are happy because it doesn't smell anymore, I would think. <laughs> they haven't actually stood up and said they're happy, but you would think they were happy. Uh, State Parks is, is happy. They have a good system of volunteers and staff who continue to do weeding and monitoring and, and um, all the interpretive education. All the interpretive education, you know, so so it's it's turned into a, a community effort and a community um, resource, you know, which is really what it takes to keep a project successful is, is you've got to have buy-in from the people who use it. You know, you have to protect what you love. Otherwise it goes away. Good day trip. It's not that far away, right? Malibu. Just Go down to Oxnard, take the road out to Rice Road out to uh, the one, then you're in Malibu. You don't have to go in and spend 15 bucks for parking, you just park outside on the street, right? Save yourself 15 bucks. Where you want to spend the money is then go over back over the to the, go over the, the, the creek and the bridge and then tour this house right here, this Amundsen house. And it was built with the the fam Amundsen family owned all the property from Santa Monica to Oxnard. It was their ranch, right? All of Malibu was their ranch, from the ocean to Thousand Oaks. That's why the train... Right. So it's part of one of the old branches. That's why the train turns. If you go to San Diego, the train, it turns in on there because they didn't want the train going through their property. Well, Mrs. Amundsen built this insane house uh, for her daughter's wedding and for her to move in with her new hubby. And it's where the Malibu tile comes from. All the tiles were handmade and the whole house is made out of tile. And it's, it's part of the state park town. You can tour it. It's a sweet, sweet, sweet house. One of the prettiest houses you'll ever see. It's a good little day trip. And you go spend $15 on a sandwich that you spend $5 for here in Malibu. See, mine was a sandwich. Or you go get some Levi's, the Foo Foo Levi's, made a bunch of pear. It's a very, very eclectic, rich community down there. You've got to bring your land over. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think it, at this point we would call it a successful uh, restoration. They're still monitoring as far as um, they do the Christmas bird count there every year. And that's been interesting to kind of watch the change in, in which birds are, are using it. Uh, they've got the fish cam. And then, of course, they're, they're looking at the plant cover and that sort of thing. Um, so it's, a, it's been a good project, which is, you know, really an asset for the area. What was the installation? The installation was in 2012. Yeah, 2012. We got a call so out of the we're at at almost 18. 1999, I think, we first saw the plant list. So these projects take take a while. Well, especially when you have all the politics of a, a very rich urban neighborhood, right? Um, that it, it was quite unique. When we work on the Channel Islands, the politics are between the Nature Conservancy and the Park Service and stuff. And not that many players, and there's you know there's some, but this the closer you get to urban areas, and especially a lot of money, then you get more problems. We've never had one quite like this, um, but it's just successful. Our other really good wetland project on a large scale, we've done a lot of small ones, is the Galeva Square. We spent 10 years and about 200,000 plants and restored uh, tidal flow to the Galeva Slough. And, uh, it's now the best birding habitat, uh, short birding and, and sea birding habitat in all of San Bernardino County now. Except that it's on the airport property, so it's not readily accessible to the public. It, it is accessible with planning, you know, and permission. They have a spot where um, people can go, but it all has to be orchestrated. Because we don't want any terrorists from Westmont, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're involved with the restoration of Supreme Court on State Street, right at the end. Um, and the, yeah, we did, we did, some, we did some, some plants for that, yeah. 
Yeah, and that's an interesting little project with the, with the key word being little, you know, and um, it's, it's really more of a, like a demonstration garden, you know, mm -hmm. because there's not really enough left there to get a lot of function. Mm -hmm. That wharf, and you have a bridge, and you have the shape and, the and, and then all that area was a wetland from City College where the baseball field mm -hmm. is. All the way to downtown Santa Barbara was all wetland, right? So the beaches are natural. You've got this one little fragment, the very, very end of Mission Creek, right? It's like there's really no kind of any ecological. So function. one of the things that you want to do when you're, you know, we need to do as a society is kind of push back ourselves and concentrate ourselves and give things a little bit more room. You know, and the, the place where we always cramp is next to waterways because everybody likes to be near the water, right? Whether it's a creek or lake or the ocean or whatever. But, you know, we really should be pushing ourselves back a little bit and give those spaces some This house room. over here was built on top of a Shumash village and burial site, right? I mean, where do you want to build your house? Right on the beach, right? But we're it's down the here. We're down here collecting seeds and stuff down here, and we have to have an archaeological guide to make sure that we're not uh, disturbing the burial grounds, right? Because that's, of course, where the Shemesh wanted to live, right? Here, because they go fishing and, and all that, right? And they've got a steelhead coming up and down the creek, and they've got all the fish yeah, offshore and, the and all, the, out, all the stuff you know. down there. But yeah, we've got to stop developing, you know, really prime ecological habitat. Well, and reclaim it, and so some of the things that is, are happening in, um, like Texas, and you know where they keep getting these weather events, and houses are lost yet again, and the USDA is coming in and buying people's property, you know, at market value, recognizing that if for somebody to move, I mean, part of the problem is if you're poor, how can you move, right? Recognizing that. They need to have enough money to buy a place someplace else, and then the land's being restored, you know. And the wetland, and the wetlands are they're saying, you know, this has got to be a wetland. This, this, a wetland is going to protect the rest of the land. You're finding that in Florida, you lose your mangroves, you know, you've lost your, you've lost your, your buffer. The mouth of the Mississippi down there by, by New Orleans, New Orleans right? Uh, lots of work being done up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, around Seattle and up in that whole area. A lot of work in Portland and on all the rivers and the wetlands at the, at the mouths of the rivers in Oregon. Uh, further south you get, you get more conservative, you get more money, you get more pro-growth. Uh, you don't see as much. Although in San Diego they put a sizable dime into restoring the southern part of San Diego Bay and two or three wetlands in North County. But that's all because they had to, because they let people develop land that shouldn't be developed and they have to make it for that, right? Uh, but the further north you go, uh, more environmentally conscious, there's more of a work up there in this field. There's a lot more money involved. We're involved in a project in northeastern Oregon, uh, fishery stuff for uh, uh, migrating steelhead and uh, eight other species of fish that go up the Columbia River and spawn it. Uh, the Bonneville Power Administration you know, have all, has all these dams that they built you know, under Franklin Roosevelt to make electricity to win the war to make aluminum to claim. Uh, they're putting a billion dollars a year into fisheries restoration in Oregon and Washington. Salmon River, Snake River, Columbia River. So they got jobs. And then all the tributaries up there. So. Uh, if you're into fisheries biology, you're into being outside and you know, having fun. I mean, these guys that we work with up there, are just like down here, they just love being outside. They love to take something that's, that's mucked up, not working, and then turn around and make it work. And then when they come back, we have photo point shots, so you get to see the same thing every year. It gets better and better, and then, you know, they're monitoring for stuff. We're flying drones over some of our sites now, so we can monitor cheaper rather than have to hike 20 miles, you know, fly the ground in film the whole thing. Hiking is fun too. I mean, if I was trying to about this property, one day we hike nine miles. Well, there's nothing like ground truth. And drones are great, but there's nothing like ground truth. Uh, you definitely stay fit. 
So any we've got, we've got John said, we've got an ecological restoration class at State College if you know anybody. Um, and then we're, we're, um, we're going to be doing a trip to Cuba, not this December, but next December. To look at sustainable to egg. To look at sustainable egg and, and how they're, you know, integrating. And that's kind of more where we're moving these days with us. There's more people is, is we're, we're looking at how can we do what we need to do for humans, you know, which is grow food and have a place to live without totally disrupting every other natural thing in the world. And the kind of common, the, the phrase that's been coined is farming with the wild, right? So how can you, how can you um, allow the bears and the bobcats and the mountain lions and, and, and you know, everything else to live out its life and still farm, grow food, grow food and have a place to live? So the other part of Growing Solutions, this is a healthy habitat program where we get students involved in restoring habitat. We also have a program called Future Solutions, which is a sustainability stuff. Organic food production, green energy, solar energy, composting toilets, you know, electric vehicles, that whole angle. And so we have 40 acres where we can take in four interns a semester where you, you guide them to the school deep. Right, pick up those skills. How to live on a piece of land without ruining it. Karen, Karen has 12 game cameras, 10 game cameras. Mm -hmm. And so we, every every day we can see who's living on our property or who's going through our property. Bear, bobcat, Who's cow, using the road? Coyotes, deer. Turns out everybody uses the road. <laughs> yeah, not just us. <laughs> yeah, but it's fun. Uh, our bird population has is, uh, is increased with We've got money from the government to you know, create corridors through it, the data plants of the birds. Um, you know, it's, it's functioning much more ecologically than it did when we bought it as a monoculture of avocados, right? Because we added biodiversity and native plants and stuff. So you can check our webpage out, it's all in there, growingsolutions.org. I've got some business okay, cards back there. We've got some questions. Any we've got questions? about eight minutes for questions, six minutes for questions. Anybody want to? That's a question to put two cents in. Uh, are there other organizations like yours in the area? Like, uh, uh, <laughs> well, Heal the Ocean works on water quality only. They don't do habitat restoration, but they lobby for water quality. Yeah, and there's, you know, one of our former students and employees has started a, a he calls it clearwaterways.org, which is for basically beach cleanup. You know, but he's he's looking at plastics and and how bad they are for the environment. And so he organized, you know, so that's sort of his slant is is the beach cleanup. There's also a channel keeper, but they're more the marine environment and what's getting in the marine environment and, and you know and lobbying and do this and yeah. do that. As far as um, hands-on habitat restoration, there's the Cheadle Center at UCSB uh, under, under the, the bleachers at the football stadium or soccer stadium. Uh, they do habitat restoration just on UCSB's property. Um, uh, and they have an undergraduate degree there, I think. It's not graduate, it's undergraduate. Um, but no, there's really no other, there's Mo Gomez that does uh, fishery <laughs> stuff, but he doesn't. Um, uh, Ken Owen, his group is called uh, Channel okay. Islands Restoration. Yeah. He's more of a weed guy, um, although he does have a native plant nursery on San Nicolas Island. Um, we were just out on San Clemente Island, that's owned by the Navy. A lot of restoration work being coordinated by San Diego State. Believe it or not, San Diego State has got one of the better programs in restoration ecology. It was founded by a guy named Aldo Leopold when he started to try to restore the prairies that were, uh, you know, became the dust bowl when they put the deep plow into the tall perennial grasses of the Midwest. And he just started on the University of Wisconsin campus, Madison, uh, just just right out the back door of the campus where it was just all the great new roads land and start 
creating a science where how do you put this stuff back together? So Madison is actually the, the premier school for restoration ecology because that's where it was started. But on the West Coast is uh, San Diego State, Davis, um, and then you get up to Portland, Oregon State, and then the University of Washington were to be the main places. And there's lots of small private schools that are that are you know have programs, but as far as and, and you know if you go into any given area, like if you went up to the Northwest, there's other nonprofits up there that are doing things. Um, but in our area, we've got it's, a, uh, what Larry is. Be that's your sister's hubby, brother-in-law. Brother-in-law. Uh, he works for the Yam Hill Soil and Conservation District, uh, and he what he does is he brokers land deals, puts them into conservation easements. <coughs> so a farmer would say, "Look, I don't want when I die this land to get sold and have somebody rip it all up and put a vineyard in there or put a subdivision in there." So you tie up your land in a conservation easement and you say. It, this will never get destroyed, right? It's held. The title is held. You can never, and then you then you go through restoration, and he's got to be plant nurseries in some of these properties. So that's another good angle for. And, and that's also yeah. they're they're doing this farming with the wild thing, where they're where you know, as a landowner, they can say, but I want my kids to be able to farm and they run cattle or whatever, you know. And so they can work in their parameters. And then say, but you know, I don't want this hillside lo this hillside log, but I want to farm this low ground, right? And so they're working in all the various different parameters that they're interested in to make it a sustainable system for everybody. Now, the Oregon property that we managed, really steep canyon with a beautiful creek, great fish habitat that was destroyed by logging in the 30s, and we put a fence on both sides of the top so the cows can't get down in there and muck up the creek. And that isn't a conservation easement. I can't take those trees out of there, right? Locked up a million dollars worth of timber, but, you know, whatever. It's, it's fish habitat now. It was too steep to log anyway. If you log it, you're going to destroy it anyway. So we just locked it up, right? Um, so a lot of different, you know, state, federal agencies, there's uh, nonprofits doing this, there's these special uh, districts. There's for profit corporations like the one we're working with at the coast right now, AECOM, big, big international corporation that you know builds military bases and does this and that. and they have a biological division. And so this is an old shell oil processing facility and that they show wants to get out of it and they have to put it back in good condition before they can sell it or give it to the land trust. So we're, we're growing all these plants and we're reshaping the whole thing and putting a creek back and, and AECOM is the general on that. Right? So they hire biologists and hydrologists and all that. Um, oh anyway, I think we're just about there. Any more questions? Yeah. You guys learn anything? We're glad you came. We're